we have one more speaker to bring out in our breakfast program. Uh, in a moment, I'll be bringing out John Katzman. John is the founder and CEO of Noodle, which connects universities, technology, students, and companies to uh, lower the cost of higher ed. Uh, and he was previously founded and ran to you and was CEO and chairman of the Princeton Review. Um, so we're really, we're really thrilled to have him here. So here to talk about making ed tech work for the public good, please give it up for John Katzman. Thank you. Um, there we go. So it's been 30 years around uh, that EdTech has, uh, that we've all been working. And we're all data people. Costs of education are up across K-12 and higher ed, and outcomes are flat, or in some cases, down. Again, we can look past it, but you'd have to say, based on the data, that we're not getting it done, that the sector is failing. And, and I say we, uh, because certainly I've been a participant in it at Princeton Review, and then to you and here, and here at Noodle. But uh, but it's something worth thinking about. So education is tough to change. Some of this is not our fault. Uh, among the many problems, uh, it's hard to measure uh, real outcomes over time. K-12 governance and higher ed shared governance are hard. And parents aren't very excited about experimentation on their kids. So this is, this is a hard nut. But some of the problem is clearly us. When I look at companies, where all of our companies are based on certain assumptions, and when there are problems, it's often that those assumptions were wrong. And likewise, as an industry, if we aren't getting it done, it could be that some of the assumptions that underlie this industry are wrong, and at least should be examined. Now, it could also be that we just got to stick with it, that, we're, that if we just keep doing this, we'll see the outcomes that we have all promised everybody. That next year, if our pumpkin patch is even more sincere, So the first assumption to look at is that the degree is over. I've heard it again repeatedly over the last uh, couple days, and certainly I've been hearing it for a decade. And while we've been saying, ah, oh, we don't need degrees anymore, we could have badges, we could have certificates, uh, the value of a degree as measured by lifetime income continues to go up, both undergraduate and graduate. Now, I believe in certificate programs, but I think it's an and. Uh, Noodle is doing all sorts of things with non-degree. But it might be time to admit that maybe there's something to this credential, this degree thing, uh, and stop uh, trash talking it. Likewise, if you look at across the sector on a bunch of websites, uh, you see the girl under the tree studying you know, on laptops. You talk about competency-based education and adaptive learning. And if you think about underlying that is that learning isn't social, that you can just do this on your own, that every student's doing something different so they can't really collaborate, and that's fine. And in fact, for most students, it's not fine. For most students, it turns out that the data says that education actually is pretty social, that your interaction with other students, your interaction with faculty determines long-term outcomes. When you look at the pandemic data, kids on the autism spectrum did fine, but a lot of students didn't, and a lot of the thinking is that the isolation uh, was part of that. Are we building things that create better social functionality, that create more interaction, 
between students and faculty or, or, or less. Underlying Common Core state standards and the companies that, that teach to those standards are really a couple assumptions. One, every kid should learn the same thing at the same time. Two, I know what it is that they should learn. And three, it doesn't change from year to year. Anybody with a sibling or two kids can tell you that all of those are probably wrong. Underlying a lot of what we do, people walked in, I don't know, 20 years ago to K-12 and they said, we're going to bring data to K-12. And people said, what are you going to do with the data? What's the point? And they said, we're going to use it to fire bad teachers and close bad schools. And then you'd go drinking with them and you'd say, so what percent of teachers are bad? And they go, oh, like half. We weaponized data. We still speak about accountability in almost the same breath as we speak about data all the time. Educators generally see our products as surveillance devices and not as support systems. That's kind of on us. I was working with the New York City schools uh, doing formative assessment back in the day. And I spent the weekend doing a, a, a really interesting report. It was like looking at two questions measuring more or less the same thing but in different ways and how different schools had different outcomes. And I bring in this thing and I'm very proud and I, I'm talking to the head of accountability. And she says, put the report back in your case. She's like, bright red, leave. Never bring anything like that back here. I said, why? She said, if I take possession of that report, someone's going to FOIA it. The New York Post is going to FOIA it. They're going to find something embarrassing about some school. And then you're going to get fired, and I'm going to get fired. Even when we don't weaponize our data, someone does. There are crazy people on the far right who say we shouldn't teach history and crazy people on the far left who say we shouldn't teach math. There are a whole bunch of people who don't believe in experts and don't believe in the scientific method because it says things that are inconvenient. When we trash talk education, we are a friend of the enemy. So in the 60s, the urban planning movement, and I majored in architecture and urban planning, um, so again, I'm not pointing fingers, said we can get rid of all these tenements and we can put up these great housing projects and because they're kind of dense, we can put them in parks around it. And we built Cabrini Green and a lot of projects like it. And you know the ending, I mean, crime rates were up, these things were a disaster. Actually, that one's been torn down now. Uh, and replaced with buildings that look a lot like the buildings that were there uh, uh, beforehand. The question we have to ask ourselves is, are we the urban planners spending a lot of money, all with great intent and a good heart, but actually possibly making the problem worse or not solving it? This chart is the life expectancy of a kid born with cystic fibrosis. And what you can see is that we've made steady progress over the years. And the most interesting part of it, in the, in the 60s, um, there were about 1,000 kids born every year with CF. And they're treated in treatment centers around the country. And they were all getting together in a conference with the CF Foundation. Guy gets up and says, yeah, your life expectancy is, is like seven. I don't get it. Our patients all live into their 20s. And everybody said, you are full of crap. Like, not good. And the CF Foundation did something cool. They, um, they hired a PhD student. They studied life uh, survival rate and lung capacity in all of the CF patients across all the centers. 
And they said, we're going to do it in a no-stakes environment. We're not going to publish any names. We'll tell you how you're doing. And we'll talk to the people who are getting better outcomes and share their best practices. So two things happened. One is this chart. Um, very quickly, they started all doing the things that worked. By the way, they did have life expectancy in the 20s. He was not full of crap. And, and that's good. But the second and more important thing is that the, the, the centers on the far right of the curve continue to this day to be on the far right of the curve. It wasn't about there's a best practice, let's all do that and get stuck in 1967. It's let's continue to innovate and when something works, then share it back with everybody. And this cycle continues to this day. Life expectancy is in the, is in the 50s at this point. You've got to put down the weapon. An education genome project, if we want to use data not that way, but in a positive way, and start collecting at a, at, a, at, a, at a granular level, what are we doing in this classroom? Who are the kids in it? Who's the teacher? Where did that person train? How did they train? What's the curriculum? What's the supplemental materials? All of the data lost in, L, in, in, in SISs, marry it to the data we're already collecting pretty well in the uh, uh, at the college level of the, the, somebody help me. Thank you. And then with income data and tax data and, and other kinds of metrics on the other side, we can actually start getting the same kind of curve that we get in CF. You can't do it if it's measuring people for, for, for accountability purposes, but you can do it if you just want to improve education. One of the places to aim that data is the space in between high school and post-secondary uh, kinds of things, college and boot camps and anything else. If we can create, with policymakers and with corporations, a really smart set of on-ramps where we really help students figure out what they should be doing, find the right place, get them the skills that they need to succeed at post-secondary. We can actually make higher ed more welcoming and at the same time, we can hold them accountable for, for, for better outcomes. And speaking of higher ed accountability, we can avoid the mistakes we made in K-12 by acknowledging that every program has different goals. In the same way every sport has different rules and different goals, every program, and it's the root of, of where accreditation came from, should be able to define what it's trying to do and then measure against that. And it's not necessarily first year income, but telling prospective students, here's what the goals of this program are, and here's our success over time in getting to those goals, is how to think of this stuff. It's not only students who are all different, it's programs that are different. One area we should be really looking at is Title IV. We're adding $100 billion of student debt a year. It's not sustainable. And we're spending a lot of that money on marketing. Traditionally, Colleges spent about 25% of budget on teaching and about 1% to 2% on marketing and recruiting. We celebrate schools that are spending 3% to 5% on teaching and 30 plus percent on marketing and recruiting. Most of the unicorns, not just in the US but globally, in education, our unicorn are getting those valuations because they've convinced investors that it's a good idea for 30% of tuition, either paid by companies or paid by uh, 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 consumers, uh, students, should go to them to market the program. It's not sustainable and it's not good policy. 
So this chart is uh, the net tuition of two and four year schools over the past 30 years. What you'll see is over the past 20 especially, it's been flat to inflation. No one knows that. Because airlines advertise, everybody's paying a different price for their seat, but they advertise the least expensive seat. In fact, it's kind of common sense, and in every other industry, that's what you do. You price segment, but you advertise the least expensive. And it's only education where we advertise the most expensive seat. It's because colleges are terrible marketers. And as a group, they tell their story badly. The other story they tell particularly badly, liberal arts education, which we mock, that your kid's going to be an English major and, and, uh, and have nothing to do with it. Actually, liberal arts students end up with higher incomes than other students. It takes a while, but the lines cross. And liberal arts schools can't manage to tell that story. It's our job to tell that story that higher ed is actually working pretty well and that they're controlling costs pretty well, despite, by the way, uh, the one increase in the, in the public four years, despite much, much lower public subsidy of higher education. It's gone from 75% paid by the state to 25% uh, during this time. I'm working with Ben Wallerstein to create an industry association, ed tech for the public good. And a lot of industries do self-regulate, and we can do that. They're coming together and saying, what are we trying to do? And how do we become part of a real solution? How do we hold ourselves accountable for the gains that we want to see? And, uh, and how do we hold each other accountable to do that? And I hope you'll join me in doing that. I think there's so much promise here and, uh, and letting go of some of the, some of the assumptions that haven't worked uh, is how to get there. Thanks. Thank you.